rugged shores and wooden lands of the north its history of copper mines and iron ore the great lakes fishery to the farmlands of the southern counties will look around my friend and all that weighs the sportsmen in the state of michigan and sometimes when the moon brings out the diamonds in the snow and the stillness of the forest lies encased in arctic cold the wind might whisper through the trees listen if you can Hi there, come on in. The traditional two-week firearm deer season for 1991 is now history, but hunters who have tags left over can still hunt with a muzzleloader. Some designated seasons in December we'll tell you about. Also, bow hunting through the end of uh, December, January 1st to be exact, for hunters who want to brave the cold. Speaking of cold, oh, we had a bow camp in October at Houghton Lake. Freezing rain, sleet, snow, what a time it was. We're going to tell you all about it, so you stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. The end of October, usually the greatest weather of the year, there's no better time to set up a hunting camp. For many years, we've had a bow hunting camp for deer in the Houghton Lake area. Mike Ignatz, the director of the Houghton Lake Chamber of Commerce, and he's been the cook at every Houghton Lake bow camp since 1982. This past October, Stan Halati and Tom Eilers from Montague joined our camp. They won this trip at a drawing at one of our hunting awards banquets. Now, I planned to be there too, but I broke my leg a week earlier and Kathy Beitler became the hunt master. Here we are at Bow Camp 91, back up at Houghton Lake on uh, state land. Gee, Fred, you really should be here. There's a lot of deer. We've seen more deer already than we've seen in the last couple bow camps. And we've got a couple blinds set up that Mike Ignat set up for us. We've got a tree stand set up and a ground blind. And the tree stand was good, but uh, Bob, you said a net last night, and then you're moving. Why are you moving? Well, the, the stand is 10 yards from the bait, which is fine, but the deer know where the, the, the stand is. So the deer are coming from along the, the swamp here. So I've moved down into a tree down there about 25 feet in the air. They won't even know I'm up there when they walk by. You're gonna ambush them before they get to me, is that it? No, I'm just gonna watch them. <laughs> uh-huh. John, look, we've got a fresh scrape. I, uh, I didn't see this last night. Oh, this is excellent. Yep, I just, uh, just noticed it now, so. Yeah, and there was more carrots around here last night than there is now. They've been chomping on them, and they like those sugar beets, but I think they eat the carrots a lot faster. I've got just an ideal blind, you're gonna love it. <laughs> Kathy marked her blind with blaze orange ribbons for safety and to find it in the dark. They didn't bother the deer. You got to squeeze through the pines, but that's no biggie. You got a bucket to sit on. Yep, just sit right down here and, and I'm all set. And see right out to the bait pile. Last night when I was sitting here, I, uh, a deer came up and came right straight on and looked right straight into the blind, but I was up a little bit further. I'm back about five feet more now than I was last night. Kathy liked this blind, not only because it was along a swamp where there was lots of deer sign, but because it was warm. When you're on the ground, nestled in the pines, wind is going to be minimal. Now that helps if your scent would be blowing towards the deer, and it really helps when it rains, the temperature drops below freezing, and the trees become pelted with snowflakes. Kathy's husband, Bob, is used to enduring more harsh conditions. He likes an aerial view, so he almost always hunts from a tree stand. And he likes them high. He's up about 25 feet. The wind and the rain, well, he just endures it as he waits for the buck to emerge from the swamp. The rain shut down John Ford's camera gear, and it wouldn't work until it dried out back at camp. I heard you got one there, Bob. What happened? Oh, I had one walk in just at dark. Uh, shot it, run off into the swamp, probably 50 yards. I, I'm sure I heard it go down. Uh, and because of the rain and stuff, I'm not going to go out and look for it till morning. Yeah, but the tracker, we found the tracker and, and followed that as far as we could. Yeah, the game tracker worked maybe all the way to the deer. We'll find out in the morning. But enough to know where he went and what direction he went in and everything else. 
Good. And Bob Beitler never sounds excited, but he does get cranked up over deer hunting. Yeah. Were you excited? I mean, come on, you're just <laughs> Yeah, he was. When um, I heard the arrow go off, and then he whistled, and I thought, oh, boy. <laughs> well, I have to shoot a deer, so somebody in this camp has to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Now, you guys, the pressure's on. What did you see tonight? Me? I didn't see it's nothing five. tonight. Five. five? Yeah. All right, Tom. Well, I scared them mostly when I was walking up to the to the stands. And they ran off the bait piles. So you didn't get any shots, right then, huh? You didn't no, get any shots? Not this afternoon. <laughs> Got one this morning. Well, we don't no. want to talk about those kind of things. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, yeah. oh, is that right? Now you now's your time. Uh, no. <laughs> we have a hat wrong. shoot. <laughs> yeah, come on. Hey, judge the distance a little wrong. You're I, walking uh, your blind. I shot a twenty yarder <laughs> with my thirty yard pin and uh Shout over it. <laughs> that'll yep. do it. Yeah, that'll do John, it. they're blaming you for this. I keep hearing them say uh, what John said and John saw. Uh, I don't think that's right. <laughs> not right at all. I'm not I think you get to shoot the first arrow tomorrow at some hats. You know, I figure Fred's not here. Somebody's got to screw up everything. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I would have loved to be with this crew at Bow Camp, but I hadn't yet recovered from screwing up a hockey game. And this weather was nothing I could handle with my newly broken leg. John Ford taped Bob Beitler's deer earlier this morning. We're going to show it to you in a minute. But this was the situation on the third day of bow camp. Tom Eilers was nestled at the base of a white pine tree where keeping warm was a major project. He had a good view of a deer crossing area. His mask was partly for camouflage and partly to keep warm. His sugar beets and corn drew a crowd of squirrels and birds throughout the day. That's something to look at and an entertaining part of baiting. On an overhead limb, the feather game vane showed the direction the wind was blowing. It was right. With John Ford at Tom's side, a doe came in to grab a bite to eat. Now, some hunters don't use bait, and some hunters use truckloads of bait. Most hunters who use bait just put out small amounts each day. They find that 90% of it, at least, is eaten by deer at night. And the deer that feed at bait piles usually aren't big bucks. In fact, they usually aren't bucks. They're does and fawns that hunters pass up in favor of something larger. That's what was happening here. Tom wanted a buck or a bigger doe, but after weeks of bow hunting, three days in the woods at this bow camp, Tom watched this deer for 10 minutes, the whole time it was facing away. That's not the way you want to shoot at a deer with an arrow for a good, clean kill, so Tom waited and contemplated. John turned the camera off, 10 minutes passed, the deer had enough to eat and turned to walk away, maybe head for the acorns at the oak woods. When it turned, Tom began drawing his arrow and John Ford flipped the camera on. Well, something had changed. The wind had died down and the deer heard the noise. You know, everybody thinks that videotaping deer should be easy, and it is if the conditions are right, but more often than not, nature is working against a cameraman. The next deer that came in, Tom took, but John didn't want to scare it away by videotaping. Hey, congratulations. Oh, are you kidding me? Thank you. Was that exciting? Or oh, what? that was outstanding, man. It was just great. I couldn't believe that. I mean, you couldn't get that, you couldn't draw on him because he was looking right at us there at first. Yep, and, and, and there was just barely enough light that uh, I could just barely see the pin and get it lined up with the string. And, uh, and then there was no weight, and he had I to go for it. I didn't dare grab the camera because I didn't want to spook her for you, but... Yeah, you know, it was... You made a good shot. It sounded great. <sighs> Talk about excitement, huh, John? Yeah, was that something? That was something. Let's go find him. Oh, yeah, let's do it, huh? In these conditions, Tom Eilers was thrilled to get a deer, and in the dark, they found it about 50 yards away. But stealing the show was Bob Beitler, who found his buck early that morning. Yeah, right about here. Well, this is a stand we put up that we talked about up here. And if you see the tracker coming down. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. standing right here. Okay. Just on the edge of this clearing then? Yeah. All right. Let's There's go. There's a tracker cap right there. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Thank goodness we had it. Uh, well, we should be able to follow this then. The tracker cap and stuff is there because I left the tracker hanging there. In the stand. Yeah. yeah. So in case the deer moved, the, the string would still be moving out. Okay. Oh, it's going to be a little bit harder to find in the snow. 
after that heavy rain last night, there's no way we could yeah, throw any blood. Yeah, the blood trail was gone last night even. Yeah, that's one thing the tracker done was show us where he turned. Okay, we still got, yeah, we still got tracker. Oh, here's part of the arrow. Looks like a arrow broke off. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Well, shoot. So it went halfway through and then broke. So right. it hit something hard. So we'll leave this here. Okay. Just so uh, we know where we last was. Now, what did he do? Did you hear him down in here then? Heard him in the water. In the water, all right. So we made a turn here, and it's real wet ahead of us, and there's kind of a game trail, so we'll just follow that and hopefully find some sign. All right. Well, good luck. All right. Bob and Kathy Beitler forged through the swamp following the game trail, the logical path the deer would take. About 75 yards ahead was Bob's buck, which turned out to be the biggest buck ever taken at any of our Houghton Lake bow camps. All right, congratulations, Bob. Oh. Excellent. Well, I think it's uh, just a little bit bigger than that spike that you thought you had last night. <laughs> Maybe that's why it's so heavy now. Well, sometimes you luck out. Yeah, I guess. That's great. The six point. Yep, you got three on each side here. This one is, yeah, I guess it'd count. Well, I guess we'll let you have it. <laughs> Our bow camps have always been on state land, and because of the hunting pressure, deer are more wary later in the season. But Bob set a new stand up in a new location, which made the difference. The first Houghton Lake bow camp I attended was in 1982. Over 20 hunters in three tents took three deer. In 1985, we began smaller annual bow hunts in the same basic area. The first year of our Michigan outdoors tradition, we had six hunters. Our bunks were in the pumpkin tent, which we used for several years after that. I tell you, that year was really fun. Dave Borgeson joined us, along with Linda Judson, Mike Ignat, of course, Phil Grable, Kathy Beitler, Bob Garner, and Bob Brockwell. Man, we had a riot at this bow camp. I got the only deer the last morning after the camera crew went home. In the years that followed, the fun continued, but we didn't take any deer. One year, Kathy Beitler's dad joined us, and I challenged him to pit his compound bow against my long bow. Well, I have, I have what do you think of that? What do you think of that, Gleason? <laughs> <laughs> our aim was good, but our hunting luck wasn't. But in 1991, thanks to the hospitality of Mike Ignat and the Houghton Lake Chamber of Commerce, Jerry Burgess, Burnside RV that supplied a trailer for sleeping, Mike Ignat Jr., who scouted a good location, and Bob Beitler, of course, for getting the big buck of almost a decade at Houghton Lake Bow Camps. Mike Ignat's granddaughter, Janelle, probably thinks we do this every year. Despite what might look like big advantages for bow hunters, using bait, uh, elevated platforms, compound bows, all of these things might sound like they give the hunter an advantage, but it's not so. Bow hunting is a tough way to go, especially compared to gun hunting. But bow hunters spend more days of field per year to get their deer than gun hunters do, and they take less deer overall. In our new December-January issue of the Outdoor Digest magazine, I have a page here called Modern Challenges, where we analyzed the percentages of deer hunting awards for handgun, muzzleloader, and bow hunters over the years since 1984. In 1984, a third of our trophies reported were taken with a bow. After that, it's averaged about 15 to 16 percent. Bow hunting's a tough way to go, especially in December. That's why most hunters prefer to use other means to gather their trophies for our trophy book. Bill Tuarg from Saginaw was bow hunting Saginaw County on December 7th when this massive 12 point sauntered by his stand. That buck had a 22 inch spread. The longest tine was 11 and a half inches. In her second year of hunting, with her 20-gauge Mossberg, Claudia Leibrink took this Livingston County 11-point buck that her husband had been looking for for 30 years. You know, I've started hunting about two years ago. How come? Well, I got married and my husband hunts. <laughs> oh. And you've obviously outdone him already? Yeah, he says he's been looking for this deer for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. So it was exciting. First. The first animal I've ever shot with a shotgun, or a gun of any kind. 
So how, how, what did you think about that? I mean, uh... Well, it shocked me. <laughs> shocked you that you did it? No, well, I hadn't seen any deer all through bow season and I didn't see any. And then I'd gone out opening day and a couple of times after that. And mm. I just went out after work one night and sat, you know, just because it was a nice evening. And he just walked out to feed. So how do you like hunting so far? I love it. Love it? Well, love great. It. Hunting isn't for everybody, but a surprising number of people, including women, enjoy it and like Claudia Leibrink from Pinckney, in their first or second year become our Michigan Outdoors Big Buck Hunter of the Week. The number one appetizer in 1988 was North Country Spread. That's in our Fish and Wild Game cooking contest in March. Eva Pecan from Posen. Oh, this is a winner. Oh, absolutely. You can see why it's a winner. You got, this could be, this is leftover venison roast. It could oh, be my. any kind of leftover game um, or beef even. And you want to grind it after it's been roasted or cooked in the oven or grilled even. And then you're going to add onions, dill pickle, celery, and a sweet pepper relish um, gives it color and mm. a little bit of sweetness to it. And you're going to mix everything all up in a, into your roast. Now, I, I hope people don't get the idea that this is just a way to use up leftovers. Oh, no. Because I have tasted this, and I think I am more enthusiastic. I could eat more of this than oh, you <laughs> almost eat any this. recipe that we've had. It'd be worth had. boiling or cooking or roasting the meat just for this. And then you're going to make a sauce out of mayonnaise and mustard and then just pour everything all together. And that kind of keeps it stuck together and just gives it a real mm -hmm. good flavor here. Well, this is a, a spread that would be on sandwiches. And, of course, Eva recommends this as an as a appetizer or a dip, but Bob Garner had to make a sandwich out of it. Hey, I'll tell you what, this is a slow process to take these things individually. <laughs> put, put a bunch, bunch of the dip on them and uh, then go to work. So if you make a triple decker like this, about two bites and you, you got it all. With a Triscuit in the middle. Mm-hmm. Boy, I tell you. Hey, try it. Don't knock it until you try it. This oh, is good stuff. I, I just heap a lot of the spread on it. Oh, this is, you know, I, I got to admit, I can't taste the elk or the venison or whatever. Oh, no, it's venison. It is venison. I mean, it's... I'm overwhelmed by the... Mm -hmm. Onions and a celery uh, and a sweet pickle relish oh. really adds to it. There's just a little bit of sweetness there. It's mm -hmm. almost like the, the bologna type mm -hmm. sandwich or ham sandwich. No. no, 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 oh, yes, it is. <laughs> no, it isn't. It it's is almost like that it in the fact like that it it's seasoning. In the fact that it's seasoning, but at the same time, with oh. this, with the venison in it, it's oh. really great. It's not all fatty. Oh, yeah. Really yeah. good. Oh, no comparison with the bologna. <laughs> This is stupendous. Oh, How come great. you didn't tell us it was this good in the recipe contest? Why should I let you in on a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> this terrific North Country spread recipe is printed in the Outdoor Digest magazine. Aha, the station you're watching right now isn't breaking away to a pledge break. We'll do that next week. Instead, we can finish Michigan Outdoors with a classic. Now, this was from our fourth show, videotaped in 1981, Pa Keeler on muzzle loading. Muzzle-loading rifles, they've played an important part in history, and like the wild turkey, they're coming back. Right, Pa Keeler? You're right, you are. They well, sure are. Pa, you're from Eaton Rapids, and you're really the dean of muzzle-loader rifle builders and users, well, and you're in the Muzzle-Loading Association. You write an article every month in Michigan Out of Doors, Pa's Powder Horn. That we do. And boy, do you look the part. What is this you have on? <clears throat> well, that uh, typical buckskins that a French voyageur would have worn back in the... 18, up to about 1830 or 40. Would they have been green like that? Yeah, more than likely. Green or brown or whatever color they happen to come out. It depends on what they dyed them, of course. Green in the fringe uh -huh. kind of helped, helped you hide out. And this was made out of a Hudson Bay blanket. This uh, wool, wool jacket? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You wear this out hunting? Yeah, well, you can wear it hunting. It's given, kind of takes care of the blaze orange thing. Sure. What about this knife here? Well, that's patch cutter. It, uh, deer horn handle and... Did you make this yourself? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, you, the most, you... most of the stuff you build yourself. Most of what you're wearing you built? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about your hat? Well, not hardly that. Okay, Although, that's a traditional type hat that yeah, you would have worn Yeah, the back black in hat would have worn, been worn back in that type of a country. Okay, yeah. well now to get into that powder pouch years and all, let's, let's, let's work into that through these guns. First of all, let's talk about, briefly, some of these that you have. This one, uh, an octagonal barrel here, a percussion cap yeah. that you'd set right there. Yeah, 50, 50 caliber. At, uh, it's a typical half-stock plains rifle like would have been used back in the old days and being used around here. There's more of this type of a gun being hunted with than, than any other Our gun. Michigan muzzle, muzzle loaders are using these types? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here we're down to a very interesting 
Shotgun or rifle? What is uh, it? It is. It's both. Both. It's uh, a typical gun made about 1850 in Ionia, Michigan by a T. Smith. And at that time in Michigan when you went hunting, you didn't know whether you was going to run into a bear or a bird, so you, you loaded, loaded, for, loaded both. for both of them. Okay. And an awful lot of the Michigan guns were combination guns. They just sort of served a double purpose. And very ornate also. Mm -hmm. There's uh, that they, a They deer? did dress them up just a bit. Man's name is on the lock here. Mm -hmm. So this is an original old? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh, okay. well, that's years our old now. Shotgun and rifle. And of course, here's how you... That's about as far as you could get from the old one. That and just, just partially completed. A friend mm -hmm. of mine is building that out to my place, and he kind of bogged down for the summer, but he's going to be back at it pretty soon. And this is where you want a, the kind of a rifle, if you want to get what you want, you've got mm -hmm. to start out with a block of wood and build it. A uh, kit, they're fine. There's lots of people can use kits, but uh, if you want a specialized gun, the way you get it is... Build it yourself. Build it yourself, right. Okay, now let's get down here to this last one. Which is the old flintlock rifle? This, this is a flintlock. It's uh, older than the percussion cap. Oh yeah, much older. This 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 type of lock lasted 300 years and didn't go out of style until 1835. And then they kept building trade guns. And the snake on the other side of this designates a trade gun. Oh okay. That's uh, they they used those a lot and they traded the Indians, traded the trappers. This type of a gun. Okay, now what you do with this? type of rifle. You, yeah, pull, it you back. pull it back, put flint in here, close this, and then you pull that trigger and it hits that and makes a spark. And you'll see the sparks. Right like that. Mm -hmm. How about doing that for us? Load well, this up for us. We, we can. Uh, I assume you don't want it loaded, really. Not with a not with no, a ball okay. or any uh, uh, pellets. In this pouch you would have everything you need to load it with. This mm -hmm. is a typical old original powder flask made out of horn. The charger holds about two drams, which would be a light 20 gauge load. Can you put a little uh, Powder right there. And that's black powder. Okay. We'll drop that down in the barrel. That's what you do out in the woods. Put that in the barrel and put the cover back on, of course. Uh, oh. Then you would dig in the, if you was going to load it with shot, you would put mm -hmm. this wad in there. Drop a wad down in there. And that, would, that, that would go in tight. Mm -hmm. And we'll leave that part out. And your ball on top of that. Yeah. Okay, just yeah. sort of a cork type wad. If, uh, if you were going to use shot again, your shot would be in this type of a flask. You can drop a load. It's just typical bird shot. That's right. Now, how does that stay in the barrel? Well, you have another little thin wad you put on top oh, of it. Oh, a wad on top yeah. of that. Okay. A little thin card wad. And now what do you do for the rifle? The, you drop a lead ball? The rifle, ball? you would put a, a lead ball, and you'd use some patching material. That's where the patch knife comes in. This, mm -hmm. this has had a had a piece or two cut out of it where you've pressed it down on there and cut a round hole. Well, how about uh, putting that powder charge in the pan? Okay. All righty. We'll jar it down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Now this, this is a priming horn. This is uh -huh. fine powder. Okay. You drop the powder in the pan. What's going to happen is the flint is going to spark, ignite the powder in the pan, go through this little hole that you clean out, ignite the powder in there. And this, this is a touch off. hole pick that you mm -hmm. usually keep it clear. Now, you understand that these are like a temperamental youngster. When you're showing them off, they don't always do it. Well, let's see what happens. Pa Keeler firing the old, firing the old flint. Wow. That's the way. It worked that time. How many deer have you gotten with a muzzle loader? Uh, eight mule deer, white tails, a mule deer, and an antelope. Well, that was Fred Trost in 1981, show number four. Here we are in our 11th year on public television. Next week, of course, is Big Buck Night. We Get outdoors this weekend if you can. It's a great place to be. See you next week. Next week on Outdoors, it's our one-hour Big Buck Night special at 8 p.m. statewide Thursday night featuring the hunters who have taken the biggest bucks from the 1991 season. You'll see the racks and hear hunter stories. We're also going to have an exclusive interview with Governor John Engler. We're going to talk about his reorganization of the DNR. Most environmental groups are on his back, but we believe that this is good news for sportsmen. Details next week right here on Michigan Outdoors.